Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Kunganisha Ministries. And uh, I think we're going to go over back over John 1, um, John, uh, sorry, John, the Gospel of John. <laughs> sorry, the Gospel of John. We're going to have a look at the Gospel of John. We're going to start with, uh, obviously, chapter 1. And we're going to have a look at um, the verses, the passages, um, and then we'll try and dissect what we think they might mean. Um, so let's crack on. And we're going to start with verses 1 to 18. So I'll read them and then we'll say, we'll see if we can dissect them a little bit. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was, mo was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own owner did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place in place we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the only one the un, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now, I love the very beginning of that, um, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, because my daughter, she came home from school about a year ago, um, trying to sort of proclaim that um, that John was crazy so this is the gospel writer john was crazy and he must have been drunk when he wrote the, wrote the opening verse of today's passage and say in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god she actually tried to remember the words from the verse but she struggled however there was enough there for me to understand what she had been learning about the school and i was delighted i was delighted that the school was teaching it However, it is easy to see why she couldn't understand. I estimate that the vast majority of adults don't understand it either. But the word was if, but the word was Jesus. And if we substitute the word for Jesus, it come, becomes far better to understand. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Whereas the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus on facts, albeit presented in, to different audiences, John's gospel focuses much more on the heart of Jesus, who he really was, and why he did what he did. So Jesus' message was one of love and salvation, and John focuses on these throughout his writings. And in this first passage, he dives straight in with who Jesus was and still is. I'm often asked where in the Bible does it say that Jesus is God? But to me, 
this passage says it all and creates no doubt as to the divinity of Jesus. Through him all things were made, and he came to spread light into the darkness. God became flesh in the form of Jesus and dwelled among us, and he still dwells among us in the form of the Holy of, uh, form of, <clears throat> of the Holy Trinity, sorry, the Holy Spirit, the third element of the Trinity. And John the Baptist came before him to testify that he was the light of the world. The coming of John the Baptist was prophesied in the Old Testament in both Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 5, and Malachi uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, and chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. He came in the spirit of Elijah to set a straight path for the Messiah. John said that Moses came to give the, give the law by which the, the Jews lived, but Jesus came to give grace and truth by which both Jews and Gentiles can live. If this is you and me. God gives us grace, a grace that we don't deserve, but we can claim it through his son, Jesus Christ. So we can kind of see that um, the Trinity is forming here. In that first verse, we see that Jesus uh, was Jesus is the Word, or Jesus was um, is God, and He was God, and He is with God. We can see all that. So we have two elements of the Trinity. I'm just going to bring up um, Genesis one, because what we can see here in the very first, very first um, verse of the very first book. So right at the very beginning of the Bible, it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we can see there, even in the beginning, that the Spirit was there. So Jesus was in the beginning, was with God, and was God. And the Spirit was there in the beginning. So we have the three elements there right at the very beginning. So this to me, it shows us that the Holy Trinity or the Holy the Trinity is real and that we have Jesus, we have God, and we have the Holy Spirit. Now I want to move on now to verses 19 to 28. Where are we? 19 to 28. Now, this was John's testimony when a Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fa fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet. I am the voice, uh, the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now, the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah? nor Elijah, nor the prophet. I baptise with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptising. John the Baptist is questioned about his identity by those sent by the Jewish leaders. Is he the Messiah? No. Is he the prophet then? No. Then who is John the Baptist? Many Jews believed he was a prophet. Possibly Elijah returned, as he clearly seemed to have the spirit of Elijah, and he had a lot of similarities in, in his abrasiveness, in the way that he dressed. But John answered, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. 
And it is a quote that is direct from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. John the Baptist is then asked why he baptizes if he is none of the aforementioned, so he is not the Messiah, he is not the prophet, he is not Elijah. So why is he baptizing? John replies that he baptizes with water, but the one who comes after him, the one who is not worthy to un he is not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. <laughs> he will be greater than he. In all the Gospels, we see that baptism is introduced with John the, ba John the Baptist. His message is one of repentance of sin and cleansing in waters of, of the River Jordan. We don't really see Jesus doing his, doing his ministry by baptising people. But the disciples were baptised in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And we can see this in Acts chapter 2. And it is the baptism in the Holy Spirit that we should be seeking. In Acts chapter 8 verses 26 to 40, we see Philip baptising the Ethiopian eunuch. On coming out of the water, the Holy Spirit was with them whisking away Philip from beside the Ethiopian eunuch and giving him much rejoicing. And it is baptism in the Holy Spirit that we should be seeking too. We undergo full immersion baptism as a sign that we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour and have repented of our sins. Full, imm full immersion baptism cleanses us but do we receive the Holy Spirit there and then? Many people will claim that they do, or at least they feel different. They feel joyous. But if you don't feel a change, if you don't feel joyous on coming out of that water, does that mean that the Holy Spirit hasn't come? When I entered the waters for baptism, I didn't emerge feeling different. I certainly have recognised the presence of the Holy Spirit in times since that day, and perhaps I can say that I have felt its presence before my full immersion baptism. When we look at Acts 10 and the story of Cornelius and the centurion, Cornelius and all those around had the Holy Spirit poured upon them, then uh, upon them, and they started speaking in tongues. It was then that the apostle Peter ordered that they should be baptized in water. Baptising in water is a symbolic way of recognising our faith in Jesus and that we repent of our sins. But let's seek to invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts and be truly baptised in the Spirit, whether it be before full of baptism in water, during full baptism in water, or after it. So let us now look at verses 29 to 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, The man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptising with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptise with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. We can see already how the Gospel of John is differing from the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. The Synoptic Gospels concentrated on facts about Jesus and John focuses on who Jesus was. And rather than mentioning John the Baptist's work, John the Gospel writer looks at John the Baptist as the witness to Jesus and his being the, him being the Messiah. 
we don't see John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the River Jordan as we did in the other Gospels. The other Gospels actually said that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. But here in the Gospel of John, um, chapter one, we don't see that. <clears throat> but he is telling the world that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jewish society had to offer an unblemished lamb to, to God as a sacrifice for their sin. But God is offering his son as a sacrificial lamb to save whoever believes in him, salva him salvation from their sins. This is John the Baptist's announcement as Jesus heads towards him. The Spirit, Holy Spirit had come and rested on Jesus and John had seen this. But there is no mention that Jesus had been baptised by John in the waters. Hence, the gospel, writer, the gospel writer is more concerned on Jan, John the Baptist's witness statement as opposed to what the Baptist had done or, or performed. And John the Baptist himself had been told by the one who sent him to baptise in water, God, that having seen the Spirit rest upon him, Jesus was God's chosen one. Intriguingly, John said that he himself did not know him. Jesus was his cousin, so he would have known Jesus, the man. But though he may have suspected there was something extraordinary about him, he wouldn't have known he was the Jesus, the Son of God, until the Spirit had rested upon him. John said that God had sent him to baptise with water. He was God's messenger, and it was his ministry to pave the way for God's chosen one, and he fulfilled it to the letter. We are messengers too. Jesus' disciples equipped uh, Jesus, his disciples equipped to shine his glory to the world. So we too are disciples, and we are equipped to shine the light of Jesus Christ to all nations. So let us fulfill our ministry to the full, too. So we now look at 35 to 42. The next day, John was, was there again with, the two, with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed him. Uh, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peters's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. There was a song which is called, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. It was a song released by the Irish band U2 in 1987. Have we found what we are looking for? Do we even know what we are looking for or wanting out of life? The likelihood is that when we think we have found what we want, that satisfaction, it won't last forever. Our desires will be satisfied for a short period and then a new search will begin. In the passage today, we see two of John the Baptist's disciples turn and follow Jesus. And they follow Jesus, Jesus with John the Baptist's blessings because he knows that authority that Jesus commands is much greater than his. Jesus asks us to, what do you want? It sounds like a very blunt question from somebody who is irritated by their presence. But I doubt that, that this was how Jesus intended his question to be taken. And do these two disciples 
one of which we we come to understand is Andrew, truly know what they want. They had been following John the Baptist, someone with radical message and a radical lifestyle. Something had drawn them to him, but now they turn to Jesus. In our search for finding true happiness, true contentment, we have probably tried many options, none of which have, have, have been lasting or, um, or fulfilling. Turning to Jesus to find that he had what he has to offer, love, peace and salvation, not only provides lasting fulfilment, but it also provides eternal fulfilment. These two, these two disciples have started that journey, and one of them, Andrew, calls his brother Simon, soon to be called Peter, to join them on the road too. A journey with Christ may be difficult at times, having to endure hardships, but it won't be boring, and the rewards will be great, and they will be everlasting. Who are you going to call to to come with you on his journey? Bono was the lead vocalist of U2 and is now a committed Christian. He is open about his faith, so I'm sure he has been able to call others to walk with him on his journey with Christ. And I'm also sure that he has found what he was looking for. So we finally look at verses 43 to 51. The next, next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So Jesus is starting to build up a following. We see from the previous passage that two of John the Baptist's disciples are now following Jesus. And one of them, Andrew, gets his brother Simon, now known as Peter, to join in on the act. Next in line is Philip, whom Jesus says, follow me. Like Andrew and Peter, Philip was from Bethsaida. Whether the brothers knew Philip beforehand, we don't know. But Bethsaida seemed to be a fruitful recruiting place for Jesus. As we go through our ministry, encouraging people to turn to Christ, we will find areas where the harvest field is ripe and a significant harvest is reaped. But there will be there will be other areas <clears throat> where the message we have about the, the love, hope and salvation offered through Jesus Christ will fall on deaf ears. At that point, we need to shake the dust from our feet and move on. Philip is immediately onto his recruitment drive and spots Nathaniel, also referred to as Bartholomew. Philip believes that they have found the one that scripture foretold, Jesus of Nazareth being the one. Nathaniel's response was, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was quite, it was a quiet backwater in the region. With all the genealogy in scripture and all the various place names mentioned, not once is Nazareth mentioned. In fact, Nathaniel's question was very much a, a Jewish view of this town. But something great was to come from Nazareth and Philip invites Nathaniel to come and see for himself. Very often people will make judgment on reputation. 
We can judge both people and places by the things we have heard about them. Indeed, people have made judgments about me from what they hear without getting to know me, know the real me first. Nathaniel does accept the invite to come and see for himself who the real Jesus is and will come to know God through him. Upon seeing Nathaniel, Jesus says, Here truly is an Israelite where there is no deceit. Jesus knew Nathaniel before he had even spoken to him. Perhaps it was because he sat under a fig tree. Many rabbis and scholars would sit under fig trees whilst they, <laughs> whilst they studied and preached. The pure act of Jesus already knowing the qualities of Nathaniel was enough for him to declare that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. But he will see greater things than that. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Perhaps this is a reference to Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28, where Jacob had a dream. In that dream, he saw a ladder extended into heaven with angels ascending and descending. Stood above it was God. So we can see that the angels connect God to his earthly son. And one day he will return to his heavenly home. And this Nathaniel will be witness to. I saw a question earlier on, earlier on today that asked, do you believe you have a place in heaven? The answer is yes, and it should be the same answer to all who do, truly believe in Jesus Christ. We will meet him in all his glory in his heavenly home. Amen.